Thank you all. Thanks for having me. It's great uh, to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do something that might be a little uncomfortable for many of you. It certainly would have been for me at one point in my, uh, my life, and that is to entertain with me the possibility that God used evolution to bring about human beings. You don't have to believe it. I'm not asking that. Just entertain this as a hypothetical for the sake of what, I, what I'm about to say. Um, so what if it were the case that God used evolution to bring about humans? Well, if that were the case, then uh, it seems to me that we ought to, if those of us who are interested in theological topics, it would, it would behoove us to know a little bit more about this evolution stuff. Because if that's the process God used, then it says something about maybe his purposes for us. And maybe it would give us new insights in how to think about human nature. And of course, human nature, theological anthropology, is a broad-reaching kind of area of theological research. And among the many topics that intersects with theological anthropology is this question of what does it mean to live a good life, a full life, the abundant life that Jesus wants us to have, that he came to bring to us. What's a thriving life or flourishing? There are lots of synonyms for this. Can evolutionary sciences generally, maybe evolutionary psychology in particular, give us fresh insights on that question? I think so. Um, and, and I say this with slight wrinkles in my eyebrow and sort of twitchiness over here because I'm exploring this space with you. And that was sort of the book project, was exploring this possibility. And it's one of those strange book projects that when I finished writing it, I left going, wow, I've just made things worse, maybe in many ways instead of better. Um, I'm not sure I'm satisfied. Uh, I'm slightly scared. But it was kind of exhilarating at the same time. And um, hopefully some of the ideas that I'm going to suggest today will uh, strike you in a similar manner. Of course, our theological tradition has all kinds of resources for thinking about well, what does it mean to thrive? What does it mean to flourish? Um, what is that abundant life that Jesus wants for us? We could emphasize sort of uh, imitating Christ. We could emphasize um, living into our created natures as in the image of God. Um, we could think about cultivating the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. These are all pathways or pointers, directions toward our telos, our purpose, that thriving life that we're supposed to be ever approaching. But none of that's news to us, right? That's the old stuff we've had in our tradition for thousands of years now. And yet we look around and it sure doesn't look like we're thriving, flourishing the way we ought to be even though that's not news. Well, why not? Why aren't people who are devoted Christ followers thriving more than they are? We were talking earlier about one of these, you know, little indicators that things aren't quite right. Uh, in the United States, uh, I guess obesity levels are somewhere around 50% now of our population. They're growing every decade a little bit more which leads, of course, to heart disease, diabetes, risk factors for all kinds of diseases. And the United States isn't the only nation that's seen this kind of move. Well, what's that about? Why is that going on? Anxiety is another kind of public health issue that is, has been rapidly on the rise in the last several decades. Um, and all of the disorders that are associated with anxiety, depression, suicide, these haven't gone away. Why not? What's going on there? Even though poverty, by some measures, is sort of globally at an all-time low, uh, we're much less, believe it or not, violent than apparently we were in the past. Violence just keeps coming down. Um, lots of things, people have more freedoms now than in centuries past. Lots of things seem to be going well, and yet 
we don't seem to be flourishing or thriving how we might expect. What's that about? Well, I'm optimistic that the sciences could be good um, resources, tools for theological inquiry on these topics to help make progress and provide new, fresh perspectives on these big questions like what does it mean to flourish? Um, and for some of the sciences that I want to talk about today, they are best located within this sphere of evolutionary sciences. You can get a lot of the deliverances without going the evolution route, but they make a lot more sense from that perspective. So let me just say something about what, what do I mean by evolution at this point, and what I mean is the, the view that humans have, and notice I framed it in terms of God has used evolution to bring about species like us, from common ancestors who were not us. They were not humans, okay? So that's this common descent kind of idea through a process that is usually called natural selection. You could call it providence if you like. Um, that God has used some kind of system by which our genetic code, among other things, mutate and change. And then selection pressures of the environment then lead to different variants of uh, those, those organisms. Over time, you can see sort of large-scale cumulative changes on the order of what we might call species changes, okay? So I am saying, yeah, let's go on with what people like to term macroevolution, all right? Some really important features of evolution then are some kind of variation, changes, mutation, and some kind of selection pressure. And a big key term in there is this idea of fitness. Our fitness, or the fitness of an organism, is how well it manages to replicate, given these environmental constraints, uh, pressures, select selective pressures, they're often called, okay? Or you might think, how well does the nature of the animal, its biological endowment plus everything that sort of goes along with that, how well does it meet the uh, challenges of its niche, its environment, the local environment, okay? So nature and niche, and I'm bringing up those terms because they'll become important later, all right? Okay, what then about evolutionary psychology? Well, psychology is the science of human thought and behavior. Okay, the science of human thought and behavior. Evolutionary psychology then is just that science of human thought and behavior done from the perspective of evolution. Okay, that humans are evolved creatures. And that helps us better understand human thought and human behavior. That's what it is. There are lots of different sorts of fights within you know, the psychological guild over what counts and what doesn't, but for our purposes, that's good enough. All right. Now these evolutionary sciences, evolutionary psychology, and it's sort of, um, and other disciplines in the area like developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, cognitive sciences, social psychology, uh, all of which can be approached from an evolutionary perspective. Anthropology, especially biological, or nowadays often called evolutionary anthropology, all of these sciences are really concerned with these big issues of, of, of what in the world is human nature and how do we change. And so, of course, those are common concerns we have with theological questions around what does it mean to flourish, to thrive, and how do we cultivate that? A big, really big kind of motivating question amongst many uh, folks who are approaching human evolution these days is, how did our species become the species that has invaded every niche, every habitat practically, okay, all over the globe? and yet do it without meaningfully changing our DNA, our genetic code. Okay, there are lots of different kinds of organisms that have managed to, they say, invade all kinds of different niches and environments. But usually they successfully invade by there being some kind of change in their biology, their nature, their genetic code. And that's not how humans do it. But we're everywhere. How'd that happen? Well, I think usually we think the easy answer to that question is, well, it has something to do with these giant melons we're carrying around on the top of our necks, right? We've got these big old powerful brains 
That's part of the solution, right? Big brains, great problem solvers. Well, yeah, okay. But it turns out, ooh, as individuals, we're not really all that amazing problem solvers. Um, you know, the, the, the lawns out here are covered with acorns. Can you turn those into food? Does anybody here know how to turn those into food? And yet, people who lived in this place knew how to turn these into food. You're really smart, educated people. Do you, could you, do you think you could figure it out if you needed to survive on those? Odds are you can't. And it's not because you're dumb. It's not because you, you know, are inferior in here in some way. It's because we're not just individual problem solvers. We are collective cultural animals who solve problems together over generations and time. Okay? So one of the motivating questions for these evolutionary kinds of scientists uh, these days is trying to figure out, well, what is it that's special about human brains that allow us to become that kind of species that can sort of end up subduing the entire world, and yet we're not doing it all by ourselves as individuals. Okay? And this has led to, um, you know, a, observations about there being, well, you might think that, um, one, I should say one way of thinking about it is that we have all of these bundles of specialized traits that you might think are as part of our nature um, that we can group into three big collections. They overlap with each other a little bit, but they're helpful to sort of group into three big buckets. One of those I'm going to just call sociality, or you might think of it as hypersociality. We are an especially social animal. Second big bucket is that we are uh, remarkably self-controlled. So we'll say self-control. And the third big bucket is that we um, can acquire expertise. Okay? So, or we can, yeah, we'll, we'll just call it expertise. So. Uh, sociality, self-control, expertise. Those are our three big buckets. And so I want to talk about each of those three buckets. What are the kind of, descriptively, what do I mean by each of those? What are the mechanisms by which we've become unusual in each of those regards? And then so what, what and who cares, okay? So that's where I'm headed, so you know. Um, but let me, before you walk away with the impression that somehow I've downplayed our, our enormous craniums, uh, let me reinforce that point a little bit. We do have huge brains. Massive brains, okay? Uh, scientists have developed what's called an encephalization quotient that is a measure of how big our brains are for the kind of animal we are with the kind of body size we are, okay? So you can look at mammals and they've created an index that's indexed at a measure of one, indicating the average brain size for an animal of that size, okay? And if you look across mammals, you'll see things like a hippopotamus has an encephalization quotient index of 0.5, indicating its brain is about half the size you would expect for an animal of that size, because a, a really big body requires a lot of brain to just to manage it, let alone to think or do anything interesting. Okay, and we know that there are these really clever animals like chimpanzees, big-brained animals with an encephalization quotient at around three, three and a half. Humans, depending on whose version of the scale, range from somewhere like five and a half to seven and a half. Okay, we have at least five times as much brain as you would expect for an animal of this size. That's a lot of brain. Okay? And most of that lot of brain is noteworthy because it is in front of our ears, in front and above our ears. It's this, this, this part, the stuff behind our foreheads, the neocortex, it's called. We have analogous brain structures with all, pretty much all other mammals, everything else, and some of the sort of 
brain stem and midbrain kinds of structures we have also in common with uh, reptiles, right? But this stuff, all of this, this, this huge forehead, of which I've got a lot of forehead, um, that stuff's new, and that's almost exclusively us. Almost, almost exclusively. We sure have a whole lot more of it than any other species that's alive today. So that's part of sort of the, the mystery is well, what, what's all that big brain for and what's it doing? And one of the leading hypotheses of the, to answer the question, why the big brain? How did that evolve? Is the social brain hypothesis. Robin Dunbar has been a champion of this. He was a colleague of mine when I was teaching at Oxford. He's a champion of what's called the social brain hypothesis. He emphasizes that the kind of animal we are as a social animal requires a huge brain. Why? It's not just because we live in really big groups. Lots of animals live in big groups. Ants live in hives, bees, you know, they've got their thing going on. Schools of fish, you know, out on the savanna. Look at all the zebra herding together. Yes, but we're different in the how we relate to each other. We relate to individuals within those groups as specific individuals. We track their identities. We track what information they have. We track their relationships with each other. We know who to go for for certain types of information and not others. That's something we don't see at the same scale in any other species. And Dunbar and his colleagues have demonstrated that there's actually a pretty strong correlation between group living sizes and neocortex sizes, suggesting that maybe the neocortex is actually really important for managing all of these relationships and information about them. Among the sort of adaptations that we seem to have that's pretty, it's at least really amped up in humans, if not entirely unique in the primate line is an area that psychologists call uh, our mentalizing ability. It's known to be mostly subserved by this sort of neocortex stuff. I say mostly, brains are complicated. I'll leave it at that. Um, but mentalizing is the ability to uh, think about the thoughts of others. Think about their desires, their goals, their intentions, what they perceive. Those of you who have spent time around children, which is pretty much everybody because you used to be a child, um, but uh, you'll, you may be aware that children by around, I don't know, nine months of age at least, are starting to do some very peculiar kinds of behaviors when it comes to interactions with humans versus other kinds of things. By nine months old, they're pointing and making vocal utterances and things like that to try to get you to do things. So instead of running over and grabbing James and trying to take him where I want, I might point and, ah, 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 something like that. And yeah, and he starts moving and he's at the ready. Why? Because as an infant, nine month old, I already know he's the kind of thing that is an agent that can move itself in response to either my declarative pointing or my vocal utterances, okay? Declarative pointing is something you do not commonly see in any other species. We can teach animals to do it. So really smart dogs can be trained up to do it. But humans seem to have invented this one. And when we point, even the nine-month-old starts doing what I'm doing, which is to look to see, is anybody else looking to where I'm pointing? We form what's called joint attention. And that joint attention is critical for things like, well, not only barking out commands, but learning what something is called. Picking up basic nouns. Chair. The baby will look over there. Chair. Okay. And they actually know what I'm talking about. They don't look at my finger and think my finger is called a chair. Okay, but that's a cognitive achievement and it's pretty unusual in the animal kingdom. But we've got it by nine months. By three years or so, we've got pretty strong evidence. And it, probably starts earlier than this, but the evidence starts to get strong in three and four year olds, know that mental states like beliefs are not equivalent to how things are in the world. That is, that beliefs can be false. That you and I might disagree about something, 
have different perspectives on things. You might be able to see something I can't see. All of these become salient to three, four, five-year-olds. And these are critical for our social interactions, for our learning from each other and so forth. These are the, the building blocks of human sociality that we just don't see. If, if we see them in other species, they're much diminished. But they really seem to be amped up in humans in a special way. Okay? Human sociality. Self-control. Pete Richardson once was doing a talk uh, uh, at, this was at Faraday Institute. We were talking about Faraday Institute earlier, right? Okay, I believe it was at Faraday Institute. He's a, uh, an anthropologist, biological anthropologist, and he made this observation that if you gathered a group of chimpanzees in a room like this, who knew each other about the amount that people in this room knew each other, with these sorts of ratios of ages and males and females and so forth, it'd be bedlam. They'd be tearing each other apart. Maybe he's right about that, but uh, I think his point was a good one, and that is humans have this amazing ability to just sit quietly. <laughs> Look at you all sitting quietly and listening to this guy you don't even know. Why? Well, partly it's because, again, you've got this amazing brain that knows how to shut down the impulses from you know, the more primitive, earlier, older parts of your brain that say, get out of here. He's insane. Leave now. Oh, but I think I'll, I think I'll give him a chance, is what the, the, you know, and it, so it shuts down these signals. You are regulating your impulses all the time. Yes, babies have a harder time at this, but they learn to do it very quickly, don't they? How to, okay, dog, don't, don't get the cookie. And it's not just be, when mom and dad are around. Sure, we can train our dogs to do those cool tricks, you know, where you, you like put the bacon on the dog's nose and it's, it's just. <laughs> and then, okay, you can have it, you know, and then it grabs it, right? Okay. But if a dog is in a room alone, it's never going to do that. <laughs> it's like bacon, yes, thank you, done. But we can internalize it even when mom's not there. We can say, okay. Mom, first, mom wouldn't want me to do this, so I'm not going to. But later, it's not the kind of person I want to be, so I'm not going to do it. How do we do that? Partly, again, it's that mentalizing ability. It's that imagining what someone else would be seeing if they were here. That's tricky already. What they'd think about what I'm thinking right now. Ooh, wow, that was meta, wasn't it? It's meta-representation, we call it. And if I can do that from a, it's taking other people's perspectives and then extracting across all of those various perspectives to a, a view from nowhere in particular on this particular action or this particular object or this particular event. I can see it from, well, it's almost what we would call an objective viewpoint about whether this is good or bad, and I can start weighing those things. Um, that's a, I, I expressed all of that self-control stuff very cognitively, but there's an affective component too, and it is that regulation of emotions. It's that we can shut down our fight and fight, in, fight, fight and flight impulses. We can just shut them down and go, I'm scared right now, but <sighs> breathe, breathe through it. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to climb up on that stage and walk around in front of a bunch of people I don't know who are staring at me. And I don't know if my fly is down or not. But I'm not going to check because they'd see me checking and then they know I'm checking. And, and then if it is down, then everyone saw. So I'm just going to hope for the best here. Right? And I can just not, again, not leave the room. I'm doing affective regulation that also calms me down. That's something we're pretty good at. Okay, self control. Third bucket, expertise. We don't all do the same thing. We don't just have a packet of instincts or behaviors that we use to solve fitness challenges in the world around us. We rely on each other to distribute the weight a little bit. You're really good at, I don't know, my daughter's really good at making clothes. 
that I don't think she knows how to build a house. Um, so I might go to her for the whole clothing thing. Um, some people know how to hunt. Some people know how to gather well. Some people know how to do sort of simple agriculture or horticulture. Some people know how to navigate social complexities. Uh, how to organize groups of people for more complex behaviors. We rely on each other's expertise. I mentioned the acorns. Um, uh, Joe Hendrick has some, a couple of fascinating books, another anthropologist who takes an evolutionary perspective. Um, and he's very much interested in how um, uh, tool creation and tool use spreads in populations and how we learn from each other so that we can acquire um, this expertise that's relevant to particular kinds of fitness challenges. And he uses this metaphor of the, uh, the acorn because apparently it takes like 20 steps to properly pre prepare an acorn so that it doesn't poison you over time. But most peoples who have used acorns as foods, no one in the community knows why any of the 20 steps work. They couldn't have invented it themselves. They're reliant on passed down knowledge from previous generations that's been acquired through who knows what process. It doesn't matter, it's lost. What matters is keep doing what the elders say we should do. Okay, we're not sort of, we sometimes get the picture that uh, especially in Western tradition, we're all you know, rugged pioneer, inventor, entrepreneur types. Henrik's point is actually humanity doesn't exist unless most of the time we're relying on received wisdom. And that's part of that passivity. It's part of that ability to teach each other. And that teaching's not easy. We are unusual amongst the animal, animal kingdom in how much we teach each other. The teaching we see in other species usually is just some kind of a we sometimes say stimulus enhancement is the fancy word. We change the environment a little bit for the kids so that they can figure it out for themselves. So uh, meerkats will do things, you know, mama meerkats will like take the stinger off of uh, uh, a scorpion and let the kid fight the stingerless scorpion. So they learn, you know, how to fight it without a stinger before introducing it to one with a stinger. But they don't say, all right, here's what you're gonna do. Oh, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Oh, no, let me tell you about it before we get in there with the scorpion. It's just kind of like, good luck, kid. I've made it a little easier for you, but that's about it. That's what we seem to see in other species, at best, at best. But what do we do? We break things down piece by piece, incrementally for kids. We try to figure out what it is that they're thinking and what they're not thinking. We get in their heads. They're getting in our heads too. That joint attention kind of stuff I was talking about. We form joint intentions to solve problems with them. That takes a very special kind of mind and a very special kind of brain to subserve that very special kind of mind. Um, we alloparent as it is known. That is, we don't just, just teach our kids I mean, that's usually the teaching we see in the rest of the animal kingdom is mama is teaching baby. So that's it. Maybe dad shows up every once in a while. But that's about it. But we don't do that. We've got professionals who dedicate their whole life to teaching other people's kids. But pretty much most of us are comfortable enough with uh, a nephew or niece, a cousin, a younger sibling, or even just a neighborhood kid walking up and saying, how do you do that? Well, okay, let me show you. Why do we do that? These weird kids walking up asking you, well, how do you do that? And we go, oh, okay. <laughs> Notice how strange that is from a comparative perspective with other species. I hope you're getting the picture that f these evolutionary scientists are actually pretty good at giving us new glasses for seeing how humans differ from other animals, as well as where the similarities are, as well as, well as reinforcing, oh yeah, we're creatures too. We're made of the same stuff. But because they respect that so much, the differences pop, right? The figure ground problem gets clearer. 
and we go, oh, wow, humans really are unusual creatures. How did we get here? Okay, three buckets. Super sociality. Self-control. Expertise. Those seem to be nice groupings of lots of traits that interact with each other, that make possible the kind of species we are, such that we can negotiate these fitness challenges of the wide diversity of niches we find ourselves in. But I want you to notice a few things. Just because we've got some powerful tools in our kit, just like any tool, they work on the problems they were designed for. They don't work infinitely good on anything. Okay? Even Spider-Man has his limitations. Self-control. We know our self-control runs out. We lose our temper when we don't want to. We get overwhelmed. Well, when's that likely to happen? Maybe it happens when we've been faced with too much decision making. When we are tired, sleep deprived, when, which leads to us being emotionally kind of strained. When we're surrounded by too many people, making too many demands on us. Again, back to decision making. Probably not the environmental context under which our self-control muscles evolved. There's a gap between the environment of evolutionary adaptedness and how those tools are being used today. We're using them in a different space. Sociality. I mentioned Robin Dunbar earlier. Dunbar earlier. He's famous for what's called Dunbar's number, which is the, it's, it's a rough estimate of the uh, number of personal relationships that uh, humans are sort of naturally tuned to um, uh, managing. How many personal genuine personal relationships can you have? He says it's about 150, with pretty big range. I mean, plus or minus about 50, but about 150 relationships. And there are rings of levels of intimacy within that, okay? But it really seems to be a function of the limitations of this mentalizing ability, among other things. We can only keep track of so many people in our heads who's related to whom, who likes whom, what they're thinking about this and that, what they know. I can only do so much of that, right? It just becomes a cost cognitively. But then there's also the cost of emotionally, relationally, or what he calls socially grooming relationships. And yes, that's borrowed from the social grooming we see in primates. He notes that they pick nits and things off of each other, and that's not just to get some, you know, little extra protein from your friend. That's not what it's about. Well, maybe it is about that too. But he says, and has produced evidence, he and his collaborators, that that releases endorphins. Uh, endorphins, uh, uh, I could break that down, but roughly it means happy juice. Uh, within us, it makes us feel good. It boosts our immune system. It gives us pain tolerance, and it makes us feel bonded with each other. And so stroking somebody's arm slowly, gently, will actually release endorphins. Fiddling through their hair and picking out nits, or as humans usually do it, more like brushing or combing and stuff does that. And we see this in schoolgirls will do this a lot too. Holding hands, physical touch. Uh, humans look like they've got other gadgets though for social grooming, like laughter. Dancing, synchronized movement. All of these things help us feel bonded with each other. They build feelings of trust, emotional connection. Okay, that helps build out our sociality. But there's a limit in the number of people we can socially groom. We can't go and pick bugs out of everybody's hair, especially if they don't have hair, right? Okay, so there are limits because there's just so much time in the day you've got to be doing other kinds of stuff. So all of this, Dunbar argues, leads to a limitation on the number of personal relationships, trusting, intimate relationships we can actually maintain. 
which was fine for ancestral peoples because they tended to live, I said it was 150, they tended to live in villages of about 150. Historically, churches were about 150 people. Even today, there are some studies that suggest that churches start splitting at around 150 people. Have we, in our culture, put too many people together, expecting too much intimacy that's impossible given our stone-aged endowment to maintain? Do we do that to pastors and ministry leaders? That's not a rhetorical question. That's, I mean, that one, I've been there. I, I worked with Young Life, it's a relational ministry. Our job was to make friends. Friends for Christ, we're gonna go out there and make friends for Christ, right? You run out of relational capacity very quickly in jobs like that. What's the result? Thin relationships, distorted relationships, burnout, frustration, anxiety. Why? We're trying to get our Stone Age mind to do something it's not really all that good at, for good reasons, but we haven't properly respected the constraints of our humanness in that space. Expertise acquisition. There are limitations there too. Some things are just easier, more natural for us to learn. There's a lot of push towards us learning STEM subjects in these days. Well, they're really hard. Kids are not timber. You can't just run them through a mill and say, hey, I want a mathematician. <laughs> oh, there it is, on the other end. Isn't that right, Ginger? I mean, you've tried this, it doesn't work. Um, these are very unusual ways of thinking that are not natural for human brains. Math, sciences, technology areas. They take a lot of cultural scaffolding and a lot of special extra support to get there. But it's not just in the sort of that kind of education, it's just life education. A lot of things that we have to do as part of our jobs, well, it doesn't push the right natural motivational buttons for us. If you're an administrator, or if you've done a lot of time in administration, you know you end up pushing a lot of paper, and it doesn't make you feel full at the end of the day. Even if you can rationalize it as it's important, it's for the greater good. Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it is. You don't come home a little lighter in your step feeling, you know, I just had a thriving day today. I did. You, you know, because it's not pushing the buttons that are naturally in our motivational systems, in our psychological systems, all right? So, I hope the picture that I'm, I'm painting here with very big and broad and sloppy brush strokes is impressing you that we've got psychological dispositions that are a function of these really special, huge brains that we have that help us to solve problems that have faced our ancestors in very special kinds of ways, but they were good for then and they're not quite as good for many of the environments we find ourselves in now. That there is a gap between our nature and our niches. I don't want to overplay this. We've always fiddled with our niches. All species do it to a certain degree. We change our environment just by living in it. But humans seem to be the species that is really very keen to solve fitness problems by changing the environment more than itself. And we're really good at it. But if we get too good at that, we make it harder for the next generation to do likewise. We keep making the gap bigger. There's a really, uh, I think a, a good example of this is sitting on about a third of the faces of people in this room. Your glasses. Pretty much all of us, if you live long enough, will need them. Why? Why do we need something to adjust our God-given sight? Because we've created a niche where we need to read little, little tiny things. We need to be able to make our eyes do something they weren't designed to do. And so we give ourselves prosthetics to solve that problem. But then that encourages us to keep investing in a world that's tinier than our eyes are good for. And so then 
those who come after us, they will need corrective lenses as well. You see what I mean? Another interesting example comes from, I just last week got fitted for a retainer for my teeth. Yes, I was one of those middle-aged people with braces of a certain sort, Invisalign, because my dentist finally said, yeah, your teeth are just too messed up and they're eventually gonna lead to real damage to your jaw, to your teeth and gums and so forth. I'm like, okay, fine. You can make me pretty, that's all right. <laughs> if, if it's medically necessary, I can do this. And that got me thinking, why in the world should so many people, roughly it's about half of us, they're saying now, and I don't think the orthodontists are just saying this because they need to buy boats, but maybe, maybe. But they're saying about half of us n need orthodontal care. So I did a little bit of reading on this. Apparently, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, we didn't. Two, three hundred years ago, you can look at dental records, jaw lines of skeletal remains, and so forth, and it turns out ancestral people, especially pre-agricultural people, really had great teeth and jaws. That our increasingly small jaws and crowded teeth is a function, it appears, one lead hypothesis, of processed foods, soft foods, not letting our kids grow up chewing on bones and things and sticks, but instead giving them baby food so that they never develop proper jaw muscles that then pull the jaw nice and big and strong and develop the teeth nice and straight. But that's our world now, that's our niche. Our niche is all of these foods, which means we have to keep bridging this gap by now orthodontal treatments. Computers are becoming a part of our niche. Well, that means we have to train people on how to create, build, com and use computers. We have to bridge the gap, okay? So I think that's a, an interesting challenge that we're facing that is pushing us toward less human flourishing or thriving than we should expect. We've created these gaps and we keep pushing them farther and farther because we're not respecting that while humans are amazing animals with amazing flexibility, we're not gods. We aren't infinitely malleable. But we are still saddled with what you might properly call a Stone Age mind. A mind that was mostly honed under Stone Age conditions to solve Stone Age problems. That's the kind of interesting perspective that an evolutionary approach gives to a question like human flourishing. And so my challenge for you as theologically minded people is to consider what I've had to say there. Of course, buy and read the book. I think my editor's here, so I think I had to say that. Um, but also consider questions like, when we go about uh, doing ministry, are we properly respecting the kinds of constraints that are being provided by human psychology? How our minds work, those Stone Age minds. Are we asking Stone Age minds to do things that they actually are not good at doing? And is that gonna lead to unintended consequences? Is it possible theologically to think about how those theological pointers to human flourishing like being conformed to the likeness of Christ can provide, can get worked out in a way to provide resources for rewriting our priorities such that we don't keep pushing this gap wider. That the idea that we are created in the image of God and the very next sentence we hear is that we are to be stewards over the creation maybe tells us something about that if we are stewarding the creation instead of dominating it, we won't so rapidly create this gap. I think those are interesting theological problems, but they're theological problems that I think we can make progress on once we enthusiastically start embracing some of these perspectives, ideas, and findings from the relevant sciences. Thank you very much.